Hi. In the previous video, we discussed the merits of not using just these word embeddings as is, but by introducing subword embeddings. In particular, what you see here are the foregrams of the original word. And in the example of the previous episode, we showed that, hey, that beginning part of words, that might share a meaning, because you can, in this case, indicate it's about cities. And you have the same thing at the end, where we might be able to say, hey, yeah, that's about something that is plural. And we argued that if you trained word embeddings for these subtokens, that you're more robust against both spelling errors, as well as in general, out of vocabulary tokens. We also demonstrated how fast text uses this and how in practice that can have merit to it. What we didn't discuss though, is how in general, you might be able to implement something like this. And there's an interesting phenomenon with neural network architectures that you can use here, so I figured in this episode I would in general explain how subword embeddings might be implemented, and then also share some details on how FastText does it exactly. So let's keep on using this example, and let's see what we can do to get this into a neural architecture. So I've got my subtokens over here, as well as my original token. What I'm just going to go ahead and do is I'm going to draw a representation for these subtokens. And I'm going to represent that using a sparse array. And the idea behind this array is that we have lots and lots of zeros, but some of the items in this array will not be a zero, and that will be because there is a subtoken that is represented by an index there. And whenever you see a black dot here, that essentially represents a one instead of a zero. In other words, this is activated because of this subtoken over here. And I won't just have that for these four grams. I might have that for three grams all the way up to six, let's say. And you can imagine that if I wanted to fit all the possible subtokens in that array, that this array was going to be quite big. Let's say capital B big, like a really big number. And it might be that I want to constrain how big this array can get. So this sparse array will be somewhat special in how it maps this subtoken to an index over here. What it's going to do is it's going to be random, but it is going to be consistently random. That means that, for example, this subtoken over here, CITI, that gets a random allocation. Let's say for all intents and purposes, it's this one. But this means that even though when I first see this subtoken, I don't know where it will end up. I do know that if I see the subtoken again, it will end up in the same spot. Another term that people sometimes use for this is called hashing. Now the downside of this approach is that two subtokens can indeed collide. We can get this awkward situation that two subtokens point to the same index. And that is something we'll just take for granted. And the way that we'll deal with that is we'll just make sure that this number B over here that we pick, that is the size of the sparse array, we'll just make sure that it's big. Not too big that we are going to have insane memory requirements, but big enough such that the probability of getting a collision is relatively small. But all in all, if we do this, we now have a sparse representation for all of our subtokens, and every subtoken gets mapped to a position in this sparse array. And let's just for emphasis remind ourselves that this is the sparse array that we start out with. But let's now say that I'm going to follow this up with a dense layer. So uh, just a dense feed forward layer. Well, what are we gonna get then? Well, for every node that's activated, we are going to have a weight. And you can hopefully see from all the connections that I'm drawing that yes, we do have many weights that will be activated and giving information to the second layer. But because the sparse layer in front has more zeros than ones, we actually only have a subset of all the weights being activated here. And let's now say that this feed forward layer over here, this has some dimensionality K. Well, I don't have a process of getting good weights here yet, 
But one thing that I do hope is clear is that what comes out of this, well, that's a numeric array of size k. And you could say that that array, that is the word embedding that belongs to cities, but it's built up of embeddings for all of these subwords. So we've not said anything about the training procedure just yet, but I do hope that you observe that, yeah, if we have a sparse array over here and we follow that up by a dense one, what comes out can be interpreted as a embedding that represents a word, even though it's built up of subwords. And that is also why, considering that we have our word embedding over here, that we sometimes refer to this layer over here as an embedding layer. And an embedding layer is pretty much just like a feed forward layer, with the exception that it doesn't have an activation function typically. But I hope that you can indeed recognize that it's an appropriate name since we are changing a sparse representation into a dense one. And that's why we call this an embedding layer at times. So if we now start thinking about the training procedure that we'd like to use, we can be very flexible actually, because this embedding over here, well, we can attach that to uh, some more layers, and we can also attach whatever cost function that we are interested in, because the main idea being here is that eventually we will hook this up to labels. And if you're wondering how we might come up with these labels, I can recommend you rewatch the Seabow and Skipgram episode that we did earlier in this series. But the idea is that we can have some sort of label attached here. And by introducing a label here, we can turn our unsupervised problem into a supervised one. And the main reason why that's interesting is because that gives us our gradient update. These labels will tell us what we predicted wrong, and that gradient signal is gonna travel back such that we can update this embedding layer over here, which effectively means that we will learn what weights we should have down here. And it's these weights that turn our subtokens into a proper word embedding. And I hope that you recognize that we are really flexible here. We can choose whatever labeling mechanism that we like. We can use whatever architecture here in the middle that we like. But I hope that you recognize that the main achievement here is happening in these two layers. We found a nice way to allow a collection of sparse subtokens to represent a single word embedding. And that is very useful. So given the situation, uh, what exactly does fast text do? Well, they don't actually have a very complicated architecture over here. Looking at the paper, it seems that they just do skip gram over here. But if you have a look at the downloadable tool, you'll notice that CBOW is also a training mechanism that you can go ahead and use. Now it's good to mention here that fast text does skip gram on a bag of n-grams with context words, rather than just target word versus context word. And if you appreciate a reminder of what context words exactly are, I recommend rewatching the skip gram and CBOW video that's also in this playlist. As far as generating subtokens go, this three to six n-grams, that's actually what they do. So that means that lots of subtokens do get generated. And the paper also mentions a system to keep the memory at bay, like what I've explained here. If you read the fast text paper, what they mention is that the representation for the word is the sum of the representation for all these subwords. And if you look at what this embedding layer is doing, then I hope that you recognize that, hey, yeah, it's something similar. If I were just to consider this node over here, then there are four subword weights that are activated. This one, this one, this one, and this one. So I hope that this video sheds some light on how you can relatively easily generate subword embeddings from just considering the neural network architecture. But I would argue to think twice if you're considering training these on your own. The fast text embeddings that are there have been pre-trained on lots of data and it can be incredibly compute intensive to repeat the same exercise. It also deserves mentioning that there is a lovely trick that we can do to make these subword embeddings a whole lot lighter. 
And that is something that I'm going to discuss in the next video.